So today's speaker is Kayla Flam. Kayla and I met at the University of Missouri where she was a student um, at that time and I was faculty and we've become colleagues over the past few years as she, um, she actually got her drone license before me, which is kind of funny um, because mm -hmm. she helped me with uh, drone camps for kids. Um, I ran drone camps and geospatial camps for kids for about nine years while I was at the University of Missouri. And Kayla works for the Missouri Botanical Garden. And I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit more about her job and her role, as well as what she does with UAS and UAVs. Um, for those of you who are joining my class, those are uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or small, um, small unmanned aerial vehicles, which are commonly called drones, but in the um, inside of the world of, of, um, of the professionals, we try to call them UAS and UAV um, so that they're not compared to things like military drones that are used for dro dropping bombs and things like that, uh, surveillance, um, because there is a difference in that. Um, I am gonna turn off my video. Like I said, use the chat for questions. I will repeat them out for the recording purposes. And if you have, um, if you're afraid to ask it to everyone, feel free. Um, I'm Shannon and feel free to privately message me in the chat for that. So Kayla, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. I'm pretty excited to chat with you today. Uh, I'm Kayla Flam. As Shannon said, we met when I was a student at the University of Missouri, Columbia, aka Mizzou here in Missouri. Um, I graduated in 2014 with a bachelor's degree in physical geography, but I also studied GIS and got my GIS certificate certificate and I also studied a little bit of me meteorology so I have a little bit of a climatology background and biogeographical background as well which has definitely served me well in my position as the GIS specialist at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, a little bit about the Missouri Botanical Garden. It is a 79 acre oasis located in the heart of St. Louis City. Um, I would like to show you where it is exactly if you're not familiar with it because of course this is all about geography so i'm going to bring that up real quick and then share my screen So here's the United States, and if you're not familiar, because I'm not sure if you have any international students joining us, but um, here in Missouri, right around here, St. Louis, zoom in, and if I turn on the imagery, you can see there's all this urban development, and here is the Missouri Botanical Garden, this little bit of green right in the heart of all of this urban development, and the reason we have the this 79 acre oasis of what we like to say beautiful horticultural display right in the heart of St. Louis is um, in 1859 Henry Shaw the founder of the Missouri Botanical Garden he was inspired by all the gardens that he saw back home in England and he wanted to start his own giant public garden so that he could share the beauty of, and wonder of plants so Basically, since 1859, we've been providing that beauty and also education and horticultural interpretation to the public and even data and research for scientists around the world. So over these past 160 or so years, we have definitely established ourselves as one of the top botanical gardens in the world. Um, but real quick, I'm going to take a do a little segue here. What is a botanical garden? Um, a lot of people, the first thing that comes to mind would be just a beautiful park with nice horticultural display from maybe plants throughout the world, but that's about it. Well, it's a little bit more than that. I like to tell people to think of it as kind of a zoo or a museum even for plants. You know, um, we bring in all these different plants. We try to target specific plants for their genetic diversity, for their rarity, for their educational purposes, and also their beauty. But we try to bring 
all these different examples of plants from the wild all together so that we can show people the wonders and beauty of our world. Um, and we try to make sure it's a very well documented and a uh, very important, a well documented uh, collection so that we can use it for science and research purposes. So um, that's the main thing that sets a botanical, gar botanical garden apart from just a pretty park is that we document all of these plants that come into our garden. So everything that is gonna remain uh, lo for longer than a year, we don't document the annuals exactly, but anything that's gonna stay for longer than a year, we document it in a database, and I can show you that database right now. We call it the Living Collections Management System. And uh, we map out where every single plant is, we document where it came from, Here's a quick example of the data behind our plants. When it came in, when it was last inventoried, what its condition is, where it's located. If I was actually signed in, right now I'm not signed in to our database, but if, it was, if I was signed in, we could see more information such as where it was collected in the world. Um, and of course, part of the importance of the documentation is to show where it came from in the world so that we can look at how the climate has changed, um, but also see, uh, make sure that we have genetic diversity because with climate change occurring, we want to try to preserve as many different individuals of some of these plants as we can because some of these plants, maybe there's only 50 individuals left in the wild and we want to be sure that we're capturing as much genetic diversity as possible because there's a very small amount still left. But uh, here's an example of mapping plants at the garden. Uh, as I said earlier, we map every single plant that is going to stay on permanent public display. And right now we have over 28,000 plants on permanent public display. That includes all these roses here, all the different trees, all the different little bulbs. And right now this display right here is only showing anything that's alive mapped and was received in 2018. If I was showing you everything, it would probably get a little slow. So that's why I just limited it to 2018. But uh, if I showed everything, it would be full of dots. Uh, and it would be very difficult to map all of these just using GPS. Now we can, and we have just mapped all of these individually using a high quality GPS unit, but what really works well, especially for smaller areas like this, so really fine scale, is heads up digitizing. So basically we have this little map showing these beds and we can plot a point relative to the other points and also the location in the bed to uh, show exactly where that plant is located. And the, good, the reason we do map all these plants is because oftentimes we have researchers come to us and say, oh, I need a sample of this one rare plant. Let's say it's the uh, the religious, no, the five-lobed palm or something. I'm not entirely sure. And then we can say, okay, it's right here. And this is the last time it was inventory. This is its history and condition at the garden over the past several years. So that's just really good scientific information for someone who wouldn't be able to fund themselves to go to Madagascar, for example. They can just come here and collect their genetic material from a plant. And then they'll have all that good information that we keep track of. Um, furthermore, uh, as part of our whole research conglomeration, we also have what we like to call the dead plant collection. So right now I'm showing you how we track the living plants collection. So the plants that are outside living, looking all beautiful. We also have the so-called dead plant collection in our herbarium. Um, whenever we take genetic material from plants, we also like to take a sample of that plant and press it and dry it out so that taxonomists, people that determine exactly how the plant fits in the web of life, for example, and how it's related to the other plants and how it's genetic, how it's evolved throughout history. They 
look at the really small details of these dried plants and that somehow magically tells them they know exactly what they're looking for. I don't, but they look at the stigmas and the pollen grains and just the general shape and structure of the flowers and all. And so anyway, in that dead plant collection, which is very important for taxonomic research, we have over 7 million specimens in our herbarium, which is quite a few. Um, so back to a little bit more about the garden, then really we're going to dive right into the drone imagery. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on and us. Kayla, yeah, quick question. Um, this living collections management system, you're not logged in, but can they go right. to it as an open access to the garden's collections? Yes, they can. You okay, can I, put, um, I put that into the it. chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, one of the things that you would rather look at, and right now it's not behaving the best because I think we've had some issues with our GIS server lately, and that's why I don't have it pulled up as an example, but I can go ahead and pull it up real quick. If you go to our website, Missouri Botanical Garden, spelled correctly, .org, and if you hover over this visit tab right here, and then map, click on map, and then down here you can see a nice little web app where you can search the plants at the garden. And that's a lot more user friendly compared to our living collections management system where if you bring this up, you'll just see the site of the garden, this little pop-up that tells you how to use it. But right now the plants aren't showing up and it's there's just an issue with our GIS services the map service right now. So the maps, the plants aren't coming up, which is really unfortunate because it looks pretty cool. But after I fix that, after I fix a different issue with my computer, then you can use this app and see what's going on. But right now I think our GIS server is just a little slow. Maybe it didn't get the memo, I don't know. But anyway. Maybe it's suffering from COVID. <clears throat> it might be, it might be. And it could also just be because it doesn't have as much attention and upkeep as it wants because it's a little bit of a drama queen like all Esri products. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just an FYI, if you do have issues with Esri products, everyone has issues with Esri products, so don't feel bad. <laughs> anyway, back to the garden. Um, and then as you just mentioned, with the Living Collections Management System, anyone can access this data and look at the plants and some of the data behind it. We do share, or we do hide uh, a lot of information such as where exactly the plant was collected because we don't want someone to go and collect material from a rare plant, for example. So we don't want them, just the general public, to be able to see exactly where these plants came from. But in addition to the Living Collections Management System, we also have what's called Tropicos, which is another great resource for anyone um, that's interested in botany, taxonomy. Um, it's just a database of scientific names and specimens, and these specimens are these dead plant collections that I was telling you about earlier. And actually, Missouri Botanical Garden is the curator and manager of this site and all the data. I do know that right now they've been, or the past several months, they've been working on a redesign of the site. So some of the links might be broken and you might have some differences in appearance. So this is what the old site looks like, or is they're changing the user interface to look a little bit more like this. But Tropicos is another great resource for anyone interested in plants. So that's enough about Missouri Botanical Garden. I'm gonna go over more of how, how do we use drones to support our mission. The garden's official mission is to discover and share knowledge about plants and their environment in order to preserve and enrich life. Um, and what we like to call the new way we've been using a lot of technology lately, so drones, high quality GPS units, um, maps on the iPad versus like old Garmin maps that you might have or paper maps. Now you can have the um, 
like satellite imagery or even drone imagery directly on your iPad. You can see exactly where you're walking and it's really helpful for if you're out in the field in an area that you're not really familiar with, it, it helps you determine where you should go and how you should get back to your car and all that. Um, so like I said, drones, we kind of consider those the new way of botanizing. Um, when I was in Mauritius recently for field work, we were joking that we have the old way, which is just sitting on the cliff and using binoculars and trying to get a good view of the plant. And then the new way, just throwing the drone off the edge, okay, not literally throwing the drone off the edge, but flying the drone off the edge of the cliff and really getting that good view of the plants and so that you can actually count how many there are. Because if there's a bunch of plants located right below where your location is on the cliff, you're probably not gonna see them all trying to use your binoculars, especially if you have a bit of a, a concave cliff. And I'm actually gonna show you some data from that in a little bit. But not only do we use the drones for scouting for plants for conservation purposes, we also use them just for mapping the bed boundaries at the garden because when people are going into the database and using their heads up digitizing, they're very reliant on having high quality maps that are up to date and ready to go at a moment's notice more or less. So I can't rely on having the city of St. Louis fly imagery every like two or three years and rely on that imagery for my background. I need to be able to fly my drone and acquire imagery one at um, more often, so a higher temporal resolution, but also at a higher spatial resolution. And I'm going to show you an example of that right here. So I wasn't able to bring in the imagery that I wanted to show you, but I am not sharing the correct screen, I'm sorry. You'll have to forgive me for not sharing the correct screen because I do have about five different apps I want to show you. So this might take a moment. New share to you. Let's go with that. So now I've brought us into ArcGIS Pro and um, this is just a quick example of, if I turn off this layer, you can see this is the imagery that's available to me just for free via the city of St. Louis. There's not a whole lot of detail. It's really fuzzy. I can't really tell where some of the paths are. We have some shadows. Um, you can't easily tell where the plants are. It's just, it's good for general base, but whenever you're working at such a fine scale like we are at the botanical garden where we want to map where all these individual plants are throughout these rocks we need drone imagery and i don't have an example of that this specific site with drone imagery but i can tell you with the drone imagery we have been able to draw in these rocks so that when we do map out the plants you can tell exactly where they are in relation to the rocks and it's incredibly easy to find the plants then uh, and then we have, um, outside of the conservation examples and then this mapping example, you might hear my cat in the background. Um, uh, hey, we, Kayla, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah, go I had, ahead. I had a question uh, come in to me. What scale do you usually map at at the garden? Because that's probably different than, say, a local government um, or a... Um, or even a, muni you know, a municipality or a state government or something like that. And the cat, it will be fine if she's crying in the background. You know, we all understand Zoom. <laughs> Quiet rocks. <laughs> um, so when we first started mapping at the garden, the best thing that we had was a, um, a four inch resolution ortho photo, which was pretty good, but 
as you can imagine, there's still some room for error. And also we couldn't get that four inch ortho photo like retaken every year or even every other year. Um, but that's what we started drawing our base map on many years ago. And then with the free imagery that's available through the city of St. Louis, that's usually one inch, uh, six inch, sorry, six inch resolution imagery. And it's helpful for just getting a general sense of it. But with the drone, I can get down to like one inch or less resolution, which is really helpful when you're trying to map out these little tiny rocks that might be six inches long and three inches wide. Um, it's also really helpful for if you want to map out a small plant. And I do wish that I had opened up this one example that I was going to show you, but it slipped my mind. Oh, finally the plants came up. Maybe the GIS server is working. <laughs> so here are our plants. The dots are not getting smaller, but there we go. Um, so we try to go with a much finer scale versus local government. And you would think like, how can you get much finer than locating a manhole cover? Um, which local government does get that fine. They have to use say one centimeter resolution or less sometimes, especially if they're doing surveying or trying to locate utilities, but they don't always use that scale. And that makes sense because it's a much larger area. Whereas for us, we're a very confined area of 79 acres. So it's a lot easier for us to manage and collect the data at such a fine resolution. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. But in addition to working at such a fine resolution, we also work at very large scale or rather small scale res resolutions. So think more statewide, countrywide, even uh, worldwide, because we try to go to locations in the world that one, we know those plants will survive or at least do pretty well outside in St. Louis because we want them to be on display for people. And two, we want to um, find these plants that we really need to focus our efforts on conserving because maybe there's not very many out in the wild or maybe they're under a high threat due to habitat loss or poaching from other people, for example. So we take these worldwide data sets, mainly climate data sets, and I've been working on that a lot lately because that's just one thing that I can actually do at home that my computer can handle. Um, where we try to match, basically do climate matching, where parts of the world that are most similar to Missouri in relation to warmest temperature, coldest temperature, um, precipitation values. We found that one of the most important values was precipitation of, during the warmest month, but that's neither here nor there. It's just an example of, we go from the really fine scale to the really like crazy worldwide scale very interesting. Um, but now I'm going to show you some examples of the tools that I use because um, you can't just get these fun little bits of information without using all the tools that are at your disposal and it's sometimes it's not a glamorous job. Okay, oftentimes it's not a glamorous job because even though we have all these awesome tools available to us, um, a lot of times we, you have to think of the compatibilities. So what software will work with what um, piece of equipment? And so for example, Android versus iOS, what flight planning software will work with what device and whether it will work with the actual drone that you have and then whether it will output information that will actually be uh, processable by your chosen uh, processing software. So I'm going to show you some of those tools. And I need to share not my screen, but my video. How do I do that? Do you know how I go back to my video? Yeah. So up at the top, um click stop sharing okay there we go okay cool so behind me you might see the cat too 
But um, behind me, you can see some of the equipment that we use here, some of the drones. Okay, you want to, here. You want in on it? There, there's your moment of fame. All right, so we have a DJI, and I'm sorry if I sound far away. So here is a Phantom 4 Pro that we've used in the field before. The unfortunate thing is it does not fold up. It's a little bulky, but it has a really good camera. So if you're just going on a really short hike or if you're just mapping at the garden, you can actually drive to where you want to map. This is a really great tool to use because it has such a great camera. But then, For field work, where you're going to be hiking quite a bit, we have this DJI Mavic 2 Zoom. It folds up real nicely here. Even the propellers fold up, but I don't have the propellers on it right now. And while this one doesn't have as good of a camera, it does take really great video and it takes good enough photos where you can still identify the plants and um, get some really good data. But then the cool thing, a really useful tool is this VR headset. It will connect to the drone and I can give it to one of my team members and they'll wear it and they can see exactly what the drone sees and then they can tell me where should I go? Where should I direct the drone to get closer to those plants that we're interested in? Because when you're using a phone screen or even an iPad screen and you're outside in the sunlight, maybe you don't have a good view of, or maybe you can't really see what's going on because the screen is really tiny, you have sunlight glare, you just can't really tell what you can, what is on your screen. But with those goggles, it's a great view. And you can really get some vertigo if you're flying a little too fast, which I never wear those and fly at the same time. That's I don't recommend it, that's dangerous. But if you hand it off to someone else who helps guide you in your flying, then it works really well. Um, other tools that I use, so those are the actual pieces of hardware that I use. For flight planning, I'm going to share, well, first I should actually share, um, there, I'm gonna share this. So before I go into a flight, before I start a flight, I, well one, actually I'm gonna back up a little bit. One thing that you can do to help train yourself for flying a drone, if you are a little nervous about flying a really expensive, like $1,500 drone naturally, you should be scared of flying that. Even though it is very stable and in some cases it almost flies itself you really need to be comfortable behind the controls. But how do you start to get comfortable? Well, you can use this DJI Flight Simulator Launcher. It's a lot like playing a video game. You can find it on DJI's website. Um, you can start it up and you're playing it at work and someone's like, what are you doing? And you're like, well, I'm actually learning how to fly the drone. You know, It helps you get used to doing two different things with your thumbs because that's that's a really big part of flying drones. You have to be comfortable with doing two different things with your hands. Um, and some people just don't quite, they don't enjoy doing that or they're not comfortable with that and that's okay. But for me, I can say that being a video gamer and having a lot of fun with playing Mario as I was growing up, for example, it's made flying a drone and learning, like catching on to it a lot easier for me because my thumbs are used to doing two different things at once. But one way to get used to the controls is to just use a flight simulator. Another good way is to use, just purchase a cheaper drone. It's not going to be a stable in flight, but that's almost a good thing because that helps you get used to the way it moves and the way you should control it in case you do lose control. And then finally, when you do start flying that real expensive drone, just take it slow. 
don't try to test the obstacle avoidance. Yes, it might have obstacle avoidance, but don't rely on that. Just use your common sense, basically. So once you're ready to fly, you always want to go through a pre-flight checklist. I actually created my own pre-flight checklist here, and I might have to share screen again so that I go to the correct one. Looks like that. So I just took an online pre-flight checklist and edited it based on what I've experienced before. So before you leave, you always want to check your weather conditions. You don't want to fly in the rain, of course. You want to make sure you have all the required permissions. And I'm sure you've gone through all of this in the earlier part of your class. But then I also added some quick references for our low pre-flight checklist. So always go through these things, always check your drone visually and by feeling it, because sometimes you don't see a, like a micro crack in your propellers, for example, but you might feel it. So not only visually inspect, but also make sure you run your fingers across all the parts of your drone and just make sure everything feels right too. Um, and then, one good tool for, can you just share the correct screen? One good tool for checking flying conditions. I didn't bring it up, but I can show you on my phone, which I'm gonna show you right now. So now I'm gonna switch to showing you a real quick, we cannot, oh, I'm sharing. Let me just pause, stop share. So I'm going to show you a flight planning app on my phone. So here we go. First of all, you can always download the Before You Fly app, which I'll show you that just real quick. It just helps you determine if you're in any restricted areas. That's weird, now you know where I live. Um, but you just tap on the screen and it'll tell you if there's uh, airspace restriction or not. Now just because it says there isn't an airspace restriction doesn't mean that there's not a local like regulation or a local rule that you'll have to follow. So this app is not is by no means uh, all-inclusive. Always make sure you have the proper permissions. So on to the flight planning. I have used this app, which is a free app through DJI. It's compatible with almost all of their drones. I'm not sure if it's compatible with every single one, um, especially the older ones, but it's compatible with all their newer ones. So I've used this DJI Pilot. I've also used um, Drone Harmony, both the app and the online interface. And I was gonna show you the online interface for Drone Harmony as well. And then I've tried to use another one called Esri Site Scan, which, yay, it's an Esri product, but um, my phone went to sleep. I'm sorry. But of course, it's very picky, like most Esri products. So if I was connected to my drone and I hit manual flight, it would show me what my drone sees, but I'm not connected to the drone right now. So if I go on a mission flight here, you can see I have three different missions set up as kind of a demo. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up the Rose Garden one here. So it'll show me my mission that I've already kind of planned out. And if you can see in the lower portion of the screen, it'll tell you approximately how far total the drone is gonna fly, the estimated time based on what drone you're using, uh, how many photos it's probably going to take. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little, it's a little less, it's just an estimate. But if I tap the more options, uh, option, the three dots right in the top screen, that's where I can set some good flight parameters, such as the maximum altitude that I want to fly at, now, right now it says 500 meters, that's not legal. So I'm gonna bump that down to what is legal, which would be 121 meters, which would be 400 feet. And it's gonna tell me 400 feet is the limit, limit so there we go. So that's my maximum altitude. Okay, it didn't set for some reason, but whatever. Um, I can set the 
what happens if I lo lose the remote control signal. And then I can, oh, uh, I can enable or disable obstacle avoidance. I have found that there are a lot of times where I do have to fly without obstacle avoidance because if I'm going up in a tree for a tree canopy, for example, to try to get a better look at how the, just the general health of the tree, then I can't do that unless I have obstacle avoidance off because it keeps seeing the branches and it's like, no, I'm not going to go in there. I'm like, yes, you are because I have control and you're fine. But so I have to turn it off. It still gets mad at me, but it works. But you have some of these general settings. If I was connected to the aircraft, it would tell me more information about the battery. You could set when the app starts yelling at you, saying when you have low battery, when it should return home. Always try to return home when you have enough battery power because you don't want to be returning home where it says, oh, you have one minute of battery power left. It's really nerve wracking. Just keep that in mind. Always make sure you have good cushioning there. But if I go in and edit this flight plan, with this app, it's incredibly easy to edit your flight plan. I just grab one of these vertices and I move it. And it automatically moves, like adjusts my flight plan. And you can see down in the bottom portion, it updates the estimated time to completion. So I make it bigger. I can adjust my altitude for the flight. I can adjust my speed. I can even go into the advanced settings and adjust my overlap ratios um, for the best quality ortho photos and 3D images. You want a high level of overlap. For ortho, ortho photos, I would recommend a minimum of 60%, but a little bit higher, 70% is good. If you're going with a 3D sort of model, 70 to 80% for sure. Um, and then you can also set what camera you're using, and that's based on the drone. I use a Phantom 4 Pro, but I can also set up a custom camera in case I have a custom camera on the drone. But planning the flight is actually so much easier than it was, say, five years ago. You just have this little app on your phone, you move your vertices, it updates your flight plan for you. Pretty nifty. So let's say I'm going to save that, and once, I was, once I'm ready to fly, and if I was connected, then that little arrow to the left, right next to where it says Flora Avenue, that would be blue, and I would hit basically go, and it would upload my flight plan to the drone. Another example of a flight plan, the, the one that I just showed you was for uh, just basically top-down mapping. So if you're just creating ortho photo, you'll want to use the top-down. But if you want a good 3D model, then you go with what's called an oblique uh, mission plan. So it looks very much the same, but the difference is, and I'm not sure if you can see it because maybe these, uh, if you just move that screen over. Anyway, um, in, this, in the right-hand side of the screen, you have one, two, three, four. You have basically different missions, and they're all going to be flown at with adjusting your gimbal, which is your camera, adjusting your camera's angle so that you get different angles of the object. So in this example, I'm looking at the Climatron, which is a large geodesic dome at the botanical garden that is pretty awesome looking and it would be really cool to get a 3D model of and I really want to do that sometime but I haven't done it yet. Uh, but if I were to do it then I would probably use this mission where my drone would be, well the first mission would be just straight top down but then second it would be adjusting the gimbal by I believe I set it to be 45 degrees and I can go in and adjust that my gimbal pitch, whether I want it to be 40, 45, and it'll adjust my flight plan based on that gimbal pitch for me. If I adjust the altitude, it will also change the flight plan. So if I go to 35 meters, my flight plan is less dense because it's higher up, so it doesn't need as many photos to get the appropriate overlap. So 
this is just one example of flight planning. I'm going to stop sharing my phone screen in a moment. Which app am I using? And I'm gonna go back to my screen here on my computer where I'm going to show you an online interface for mapping. Not that one. There you are. So what I just showed you was DJI Pilot. What I'm showing you now is called Drone Harmony. There is an app that you can use on your phone, but what I really like is there's an online interface. And it's very similar. It's a little bit stripped down compared to the phone app or the mobile app, but it's really it's still really awesome. So here's a flight that I conducted in Mauritius where I just drew out. What I can do is just draw a polygon. Oh, and then, so that's how I complete the polygon. I can set the height so I could say I want my drone to fly to a certain height, or I can even use these polygons to represent large buildings that my drone can use for its obstacle avoidance. Then I go down in this, on this button here, and I can start a new plan. I can do just top down or a double grid, which is really good for ortho mapping. But then maybe I wanna do inspection where I just do a vertical inspection of a, of a uh, structure. So that's where I would actually draw out a structure. Or maybe I just wanna do a nice circle shot, which is really good for helping with a 3D model of something like a water tower, for example. The basic mapping is the easiest one to plan. So I chose that polygon. At least I thought I chose that polygon. Oh, it's still trying to generate my plan. All right, I'll give it a moment. Oh, yes, there we go. So that's where I can set my flight altitude. Let's say 120 meters. The bad thing about this app or this online interface is it doesn't tell you what units you're using. You just have to remember what units that you've set it to use in your settings. I remember I set it to be meters. But anyway, 120, then I want my overlap. Maybe I want it to be 90%. And you can see it adjust it right there. Forward overlap is not going to change my flight pattern. It's just going to change how often it takes photos. So let's say I want only 40%. It's not going to give you a good product, but you can still set it to be 42%. And you can set up what camera you're using. And there's a lot of different options. So it's compatible with a lot of different DJI products. And then you just hit generate and there's your plan. And you open it up in the app, you launch a drone, you let it fly, everything's good and beautiful and it flew itself. And all is great, or maybe great. Just always know that you might have to take control of your drone. So that is, that's two of the flight planning apps that I have experience with. The third one would be, oops, I just messed up. There we go. Would be the Esri Site Scan, limited edition, but I also want to say it's like limited use, limited in general, because it's only compatible with certain drones. And it just so happens it's not compatible with any of my drones. <laughs> Or it would be if I had a different device, because it's also only uh, usable on an iOS device. So it's kind of give and take. You know, some apps are better on certain devices versus others. The DJI Pilot that I showed you just a few minutes ago on my phone, that works best on an Android, but it will work on an iOS device. The Drone Harmony app, it works only on an Android, but it, and it will not work on iOS, whereas this Esri Site Scan will only work on iOS, but not Android. So as I mentioned, probably like around the beginning of our talk, you just have to think of all these, not only how do you fly the drone, how do you set up the mission, how do you process the images, but also what's compatible with what? And they never really talk about that until you start to really get into the nitty gritty. 
so those are the flight planning apps. Now I'm sure you really want to see some of the data that I've collected. So let's start a new share to uh -huh, site one. So one way that we've used drones, not only for mapping at the garden for updating our base map, is we've used it for going out in the wild, the wilds of western Missouri, and scouting for a specific plant. So right now we're in ArcMap. I'm also going to show you ArcGIS Pro. Now I want to tell you don't limit yourself to one or two apps. I always try to use multiple um, apps and programs. It's good to be familiar with all the different apps and programs that are out there. So whether or not you've used ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro, I recommend that you at least familiarize yourself with it. So that's why I'm showing you both ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro today. But in this case, if I turn off my drone imagery, you can see this is not that helpful if you want to get down to the nitty gritty and really see the plants. So we went out there, we flew a drone. This is um, an ortho image of about 135 images stitched together. And if I zoom in and give it a moment to load, maybe more than a moment. Doo -doo -doo. It was there, you saw it. Now it's taking a moment. It could be because of my computer or it could be because of my internet. Who knows? So Kayla, um, Go ahead. one of the things that I'd like to point out is, um, is that you didn't start as a drone pilot at Missouri Botanical Garden. So that's while, right. Um, you started as a GIS technician. Uh, GIS specialists. So like flying drones is only a very small part of my job at the garden. Um, it's just part of my GIS portion of my job. No, a lot of what I do is mapping support and why is this not working? Well, I wanted to show you if you zoomed in, you could see the individual plants and actually identify the little what we call the scientific name is Calpha palustris. It's marsh marigold. It has bright yellow flowers and you can see them really well on the drone imagery if the drone imagery would load. Um, turn off the base map. That might cut down the internet load. Oh, you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> so if you zoom in, you can see these beautiful little yellow fluffy things in our image. And that's really good because if you go out into this little, well, uh, it's a fen or almost like a boggy area, but not as wet as a bog. But uh, if you go out there and you want to get a good survey of the population of plants, it would take you forever to go out and count every single one. And you might even miscount or count the same one twice. So just go fly the drone during the opportune time, especially when it's in bloom. And then you can just go through and highlight all the individual plants and get a good estimate of how many individuals you have. Oh, there's, there's me flying the drone. <laughs> uh, but you can just see the little plants here. This isn't the best image, and I did get more zoomed in images, but with this, it's good enough for you to see the plants. You can see the bright yellow. You can see the bright green that is that plant because fortunately this plant blooms before a lot of other plants. And also that bright yellow flower just really sticks out. And so, I want to I wanna point yeah, out, your scale at the top of the screen that you've been zooming in to like 1 to 15 and 1 to 30. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. This is so different than what many students experience when they're using uh, remote sense data that they're often looking at something that's a 30 by 30 pixel. Definitely. And the drone, the resolution, um, I, I've been watching it at the top of the screen, and it's really amazing to see the parts and pieces that you're showing in that. So for example, if I just kind of take an estimate of how large this fen is. Now, unfortunately, you can't really see how much of an area. Oh, I'm doing line. Whoops. Oh, well. Okay, let's say I go from this side of the screen all the way to this side. That's only 407 feet. It's pretty zoomed in. It's a pretty small area, but you still don't want to go and count every single plant. So yeah, like Shannon pointed out, we are working at very fine scales because this plant, for example, a little clump of it is maybe about a foot wide. 
So you're not going to see that on the regular imagery that's freely available. And you're not going to want to pay the thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars to charter a plane to fly your imagery at that scale. Drones are really the answer when you're working at a very fine scale where you just want a small area. You just need to update your map for a small area. I'm going to show you another example where we've done repeat photography. Let me share. So this site is called uh, Litzinger Road Ecology Center. It's kind of in the western part of St. Louis, kind of the middle western part of St. Louis City, or St. Louis County, I'm not sure. It's in St. Louis, and Missouri Botanical Garden owns this site. You can see the imagery here. It's there. It's about six inch resolution. You can see where the stream is, where the road is, kind of where these little paths are. It's not great though. So we decided to fly the drone there in March 2019. I'll turn that layer on. Let's see if it pops up. Might take a moment. Again, I turned the base map off. But right now it's the March 2019 imagery, it is making a call to our GIS server. So here you go. You can see the resolution is better. If I zoom in and give it a moment to load, then you'll be able to see basically tree branches, which you wouldn't be able to see on the freely available imagery. You can see how the stream has changed. In the previous image, I'm going to risk turning on the base map. You cannot really or you can tell where the stream is, but you can also see it's changed a lot between March 2016, which is where the Esri base map is from, and March 2019. You can see the stream itself has changed. So flying this imagery, doing repeat imagery is really good for monitoring the stream because streams are dynamic environments. But also at Litzinger Road Ecology Center, we have obnoxiously a sewer project that's going straight through our property right now as we speak. So we're using drone imagery to kind of monitor that project. You can see between March 2019 and October 2019, there was nothing here in March. October, there it is. There's the sewer project. It's very disruptive to our little ecological site that we've put together for educational purposes, but it's a necessary thing to help mitigate flooding. But uh, that's just a couple months, there you go. And then we flew it again in February 2020 of this year, and you can see the progress, basically, if you re keep turning it off and on. And you can even do like a swipe, but I haven't set up a swipe map. But it's just really good for them to be able to monitor not only the health and progress of their stream, but also the health of the overall environment and the progress of this very disruptive um, action that's being taken. So flying the drone, taking these repeat photographs, it's very easy because all you do is program the flight, throw the drone up there, and you're done in 40 minutes. Whereas you'd have to charter a plane every couple months if you wanted to monitor this project, which is going to be about a two-year project. And now for, oh, for non-drone folks, you're using the same flight plan. You only planned it once and you are syncing it each time you're going out for that flight, correct? Actually, no. Well, yes, two of the flights were the same. The third flight, I narrowed it down to just kind of flying that corridor because I didn't have a lot of time to spend there that day. So I was only there for 20 minutes or so. I just kind of flew the corridor of that. If I turn these off, you can see it's a little bit smaller. It's not a lot smaller, but it's definitely a bit smaller than say the March one. I focused more on the corridor. And I think in the future, I'm probably just gonna do the strip of land here as well because that's where most of the change is happening that's what we're most interested in we really don't care about this portion over here for example there's not a lot of change it's not we don't do a lot of work over there it's right next to residential portion actually 
we're right in the middle of a residential portion if I bring up the base map. So there are houses here, there are houses here. Actually, a lot of these people are rich people, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. So um, anyway. One more question. Since that's sure. an educational center, does the educational center use any of your drone imagery? Yes. And actually, that's where um, your colleague and friend Bob Coulter works. And we're working on collaborating to bring more GIS education to the garden, to just people at the garden. And not only to students that come to Litzinger Road Ecology Center, because it's primarily for students, but we're also working together to get more word out to the garden about GIS and educate them on things that they can do and maybe even get to the drone training, but I'm not sure yet. We'll see. So now I'm going to move on to another example, a very cool example that I want to show you. So as you might have been aware, I was in Mauritius last month, right before all the craziness started with the, uh, the shutdowns and everything. I'm, honestly, I barely made it home and then I was under quarantine for two weeks and I might or might not have had it, who knows. But anyway, the coolest thing was about a month and a half ago, I was in Mauritius actually. Oh, and maybe you don't know where Mauritius is. I should probably show you. Share to this. Okay, Google Maps. Mauritius is this little tiny island off the coast of Madagascar. Wee little bitty island. Um, actually, it didn't see people until the late 1600s, or the 1600s. There were no people on this island. Um, it was just the dodo bird and the giant fruit bat. And yeah, this is where the dodo bird lived until it was unfortunately eaten by all the people. Um, but over the past 400 or so years, people have really ravaged the island and only about 2% of the original forest remains on this island. And in fact, the flora of this island, the plants of this island, it has the, as a whole, this island has the third most endangered flora of the world. So it's the perfect spot for us to go and I don't want to say perfect, that sounds really bad. We're not excited that it's in danger, but because it's in danger, that's where we feel we need to go and direct some of our expedition, our international resources towards conserving the flora of this little tiny island because so much of it is under threat. There are so many different species where the number of individuals left in the wild numbers in under 100, or maybe we don't even know how many are out there in the wild because they're only hanging on in really small cliff habitats that you can't really readily access as a person, as a human, um, standing on that cliff side and trying to see these plants with your binoculars. But fortunately, we have a really cool tool called a drone that we decided to try to use out there. And so I'm gonna go back to ArcGIS Pro and I flew a series of missions, a top down and oblique and just going up and down the, um, the sides of the cliff. And I was able to come up with this nice little 3D model. This is a, a waterfall called Piedes 500 in Mauritius. The importance of this waterfall is on these cliffs around here, is a little tiny plant called Nezocodon mercianus. I'm gonna show you a picture of that plant right now, actually. If I move to here. Mauritius. This is that little plant. Can you see it? Wait, no, you can't see Not it. Not yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There we go, now I'm sharing the right screen. That's that little plant. It's a couple inches wide. Those little leaves here, they're just a couple inches long. This little 
pretty purple bell-shaped flower. It's a real nice lavender color. What's super cool about this plant is it has blood red nectar. It's like really bizarre. Hummingbirds, I bet, would love it, but hummingbirds aren't native to this area, so there's no hummingbirds here. But um, it's a small, small plant, uh, and it lives on this cliffside. And actually, if I zoom, if I move to there, so you can see in this picture here, I've circled all the ones that I either know are Nezocodon or I think are Nezocodon. And this is one of one of many images that I've combed through and circled all the little plants. But here you can see, I don't want to do annotation, but whatever. Um, you can see this is where we're at. You can't reach them. You can't see them if they're right below you unless you are falling off the cliff. So the, the drone is a perfect tool for doing this. And when I say drone, I mean a quadcopter that can actually hover in place. Um, the other type of drone would be a fixed wing drone, which is really good for covering a large amount of area. But if you're trying to focus in on a real small area, then a quadcopter is the way to go, especially if you're on a cliff. So as you can see, there's, there's a lot of, of these Nezocodon here. And originally we estimated anywhere from 20 to 50. I haven't even gotten done counting these, and I'm sure there are well over 50 of these on this cliffside, some of which are even down in this area. If I switch back to sharing this one right here, they're kind of down in this concave area, which you would never be able to see with your binoculars. So the reasoning for this this whole project is not only to count these plants and kind of get a good estimate of how many exist, how many are left here. This is one of the only sites, it's not the only site, but one of the only sites where it's known to exist in the wild now. Um, what we really want to do is have some of our people rappel down these cliffs and collect genetic material and seeds from these plants because we're really interested in preserving as much genetic diversity as possible of this very critically endangered plant. So part of that would be for planning purposes, we got a lot of photos with the drone and came up with this rough 3D model, but we can get even better, uh, a better resolution 3D model. It would just run really slow. It will help our climbers determine what the best route to take might be and also where exactly these plants are located. So I've been working on plotting out points on the 3D model. I don't have those points loaded right now, but telling you like one plant is here, one is right here, one is right here. And it's just, it's a painstaking process, but it's just one of the really cool things you can get from drone imagery. And the super cool thing is, I don't want to be in the plants here, whoops. There. The super cool thing is this 3D model comes from only imagery. It's not coming from LIDAR or any external sensors. It's just images, overlap of images. And the software is able to produce this pretty cool 3D model. It's not perfect, but it gives you a really good idea of what's going on. And what I'm really interested in is if I look at the bottom of the waterfall here, it looks like there's a cave down there. I really want to go, but I hear it's a very long hike to get to the bottom of the waterfall. I mean, it's called PH 500. It's a 500 foot drop from the top to the bottom here. So to get to the bottom, you'd have to go a totally different way. And I hear it's a really long and arduous hike, but I still really want to go see that cave or what looks like a cave. Maybe I'll get to go back and fly my drone there again. I don't know. But um, if I switch back to a different screen, this one right here. So there are my Nezocodon. Is this shared properly? I think so. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is, this image right here is taken with the drone. And this is a snapshot of our 3D model. So the colors are a little different, but you can see here. 
Now with this drone image, this little red circle, that's where we were located taking photos. So it just kind of gives you an idea of the scale, but the really great idea of the scale, let's see, I need to play the, no, not that video. There's a good video that I'm going to show you once I find it. There it is. And just to let you know, we might experience just a slight delay in what we're seeing when you were doing the 3D modeling. Um, yeah. It, it may be a little bit of a delay. So this will give you a good example of the scale of the waterfall. So this is that stream that's going off the side and we're just gonna kinda back out and fly over the waterfall. And this was collected with the the drone as With well. the little drone, the little fold up Mavic 2 zoom drone. It keeps going. And then finally you can see that what looks to be a cave at the bottom. I want to see it. Are you able to share with me that video, that specific yeah. video? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, um, go ahead. I, I will share that with others um, and I'll put that in there. And we have a question that's come in and I'm going to have Vince un, um, undo his mic and ask the questions that he has, if that's okay with you. Okay. All right. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, I have a question. Um, I guess I have, I have two. But uh, this week, and from two weeks ago, I suppose, uh, our class has been talking about flight planning and the regulate, well, and to a uh, larger extent, like the regulations behind flying here and there. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, in your work as uh, a GIS tech and drone flyer in the botanical garden. Do you have to work with some sort of risk manager or risk management team to submit paperwork? And also how did the same process apply when you're trying to fly in like a foreign country, like Mauritius? So when trying to fly in a foreign country, you definitely need to make sure you have local permissions and uh, are following all the local laws. I'm fortunate in that I had someone else line up all those different permissions, but all of our flights that we flew in Mauritius were on um, national forestry property. So we just got permission and signed paperwork through the Mauritian Forestry Service. And they just gave us blanket permission to fly basically anywhere in their property. But if we wanted to fly somewhere else, then we'd have to go through a, probably a similar process. Um, when flying at the garden, yes, we do have um, insurance and basically risk management set up. Our drones are covered under our general liability insurance, at least in my division, because I work in the horticulture division and we have a lot of equipment that we use, such as tree trimmers, um, lifts for getting up to trees. Um, lawn mowers there's there's a lot of equipment so we have a general policy for covering basically anything motorized that a staff person is using so if something were to fall on someone's car for example we'd be covered so it's always recommended to have that sort of insurance in place because you really never know when your drone might decide to have a mind of its own. Maybe a gust of wind will come in or maybe you'll experience some weird magnetic interference and your drone will just go off and do its own thing. Um, hopefully you don't have that happen, but it can happen. So always be prepared. So did you have to submit some sort of flight planning document to someone or were the flight planning 
uh, procedures you described earlier just for your own use? Uh, they were mainly for my own use. Uh, it depends on where you're working. So if I wanted to, in Mauritius, for example, if I wanted to fly outside of the areas that I did have special permission, then I would have to submit flight plans or just a general flight planning checklist to the government as part of the permitting process. Um, but since we had basically special permission from a governmental organization, they did not require that documentation, but it just depends on who you're working with. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, can I ask one more question? Is that okay, Professor? Of course, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess my last question is, uh, earlier we had a great demo on integrating uh, the data you yourself captured and then putting it into like ArcGIS and, and uh, you know, I suppose later down the line, if you wanted to, you could do your own analysis of that sort. Um, mm -hmm. um, my question specifically is, uh, like, were you trained in, like, the botanical gardens, uh, or did somebody hire you with the expectation that, okay, you need to be able to take pictures and do this kind of analysis and that kind of analysis and just give me a result? Or did some yeah. supervisor take you step it's by step? a little bit of both. So when I was hired at the botanical garden, we never really thought about using drones. I was just the general GIS specialist and I had a background in using GIS technologies for um, georeferencing, a data analysis, spatial analysis. Um, oh no, what's the word? Uh, digitizing, just general GIS things, I guess you could say, map making, cartography, um, data collection and analysis. And then as drones, I've been with the garden for over five years now, and as drones have evolved to become more affordable and more user friendly, um, as part of my job, I try to keep us on top of all the technological advancements out there. And I try to bring the best tools that I can to our use for, you know, a very reasonable price. So tacking drones on to my job description was kind of a no-brainer because, one, it sounded like fun, to be quite honest. And two, it, it was getting cheaper and easier. And three, it just makes our job easier. Instead of um, going out and trying to survey your new path that you installed in the garden, you can just fly your drone and then digitize that new path. And it's okay if it's off by an inch or two or three. We're looking at relative things here. Um, or if you want to count how many of that marsh marigold, no, marsh, yeah, marsh marigolds, um, you want to count how many there are of those in that fen, fly your drone instead of going out there and spending your entire day counting and tagging all those plants. So, um, but also, Really, it was just fun and it was a good excuse to get um, a new toy. Don't tell them that. So I assume that the Botanical Garden paid for the drones? Yes. And then I went wow. and like did a lot of my own research and kind of training, I guess you could say, just with my own little toy drone and just video gaming if you want to say that's like training but that's that's just fun <laughs> and kayla you're not the only person at the garden that flies drones so you have um another person who also does it not necessarily from a research perspective but more so from a videography perspective correct that is correct i am not the only licensed drone pilot at the botanical garden uh, we have someone in our communications department who has a little drone, I think it's a Mavic Air, a DJI Mavic Air that I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but he got his drone license before me, which, yeah, that's kind of funny, but um, he's been flying his little drone for several years now, just acquiring imagery and, photo well, photographs and video just to incorporate in his 
promo videos for the garden and just general outreach, which these little photos and videos have become really useful now with the COVID crisis because like many places, the garden is closed to the public at the moment. And unfortunately it is spring and basically we're at peak bloom. So a lot of people are very sad that they're not able to see all these beautiful flowers and trees in bloom, such as the magnolias and the cherry trees, the tulips, the dogwood, red bud, all these very pretty flowers. So Cassidy, the other drone pilot, he has been at the garden a couple days each week, just taking photos and videos both on the ground and in the air with his drone. And um, I could show you one of his videos if you'd like, but I realized that we're getting, we kind of went over time and I'm sorry about that. I'm just gonna leave you with one more video showing the scale of that waterfall and just how small that little plant is and where exactly it's located. So I'll just leave you with that. And as you're pulling that up, there's a couple of questions that have come in um, from other folks. Um, so let's start with Rachel's question. Rachel, if you want to unmute. Yes. Hi, Kayla. Hi. So my question is regarding the flights, um, like the one that you're showing. How do you capture um, the vegetation at different elevations? And like, how do you plan those flights? Do you plan a different flight at each elevation? If it's along a cliffside? Yeah. In this case, when I was flying off of the cliffside here, I flew a lot of that manually. So when I did the general over 3D overview where I programmed that flight in the GGI flight planning app that I showed earlier, I was able to automate the flight that was above everything, but as soon as I got a little bit lower, I knew I had to do it manually because even though there are some flight planning apps that allow you to bring in um, topographical information, so if you do have an existing 3D model of the area, like this one that I was able to produce, um, you can have the drone kind of obey that, um, that surface instead of thinking that the whole Earth's surface is flat. But honestly, because I was getting within five to six feet of the cliffside, I would never rely on that for controlling the drone because that's just a little too close for comfort. Because when you look at the GPS on this drone, your margin of error is already five feet. So you might be flying into the cliff. So a lot of times when you're trying to look at really small things and when you don't have like a $10,000 drone, it is best to just fly it manually. So oh, yeah, a lot of times I was flying manually. Um, there was one time where we were on a small mountain and I'm gonna actually share a photo with you of that small mountain side because of course I couldn't have done the trip in Mauritius without my team because we had a lot of different equipment. You can see this guy's carrying something. He has something in his backpack. She's carrying something. It takes a whole team to really execute one of these missions because you want someone to have vision at all times on your drone. You want someone, like the person who's actually flying it, which is always, pretty much always me, you, that person is going to be focusing on the controls that's, that are at your fingertips. You'll be glancing at the drone occasionally, just making sure you're not running into something, but you can't, you have to make sure you look at those controls. So you want someone else, a visual observer to keep an eye on your drone. And then you need someone else who's wearing the goggles to tell you, hey, that plant is here. Can you move a little bit more to the right? Or can you move up a little bit or whatever? So it takes a village to really execute a mission. Um, where I was going with showing you this photo, not only to recognize my teammates, but also this was the summit of a very small mountain called Lapoose in Mauritius. And fortunately, I was able to automate at least some of the flights with this, the ones where I just wanted a general 3D model and not getting really close and identifying those tiny, tiny plants that we were looking at. Because it's, it can be pretty easy to identify something that's maybe a couple feet wide 
on a drone photo because you're looking at spectral signatures, for example. But if you're trying to look at something that's six inches or less, you have to get really close. Otherwise, it's just going to blend in with all the other vegetation. So that's why a lot of times I do have to fly manually because I want to get very close to what I'm looking at. I hope that answers your question. It was a little long-winded. Well, it does. We also have another follow-up question that has to do with crew members and crew management. So, Jesus, if you'd like to mm -hmm. kind of follow up with that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Kayla, thank you for being here. I appreciate your presentation. Um, oh, I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. Um, I can see from the photo your crew, um, and, and I was wondering how many crew members would you bring out on a typical um, expedition out uh, on a flight mission? And I'm sure it depends on the circumstances and what the mission is, you know, do you find it more, um, more people are necessary out in the wild, like in Mauritius or mm -hmm. um, compared to the, at the Botanical Garden? And, you know, how many for each scenario would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on your mission for one. If you're going to be covering a large amount of space, such as at the garden or when I'm at Litzinger Road Ecology Center, where I'm monitoring that sewer project, sometimes mm -hmm. I just need maybe one other person to be my visual observer where I wouldn't be able to keep that drone in the line of sight um, and just make sure you're in constant contact. So sometimes you only need one other person if it's a very simple clear cut mission. Um, but if you're working in an environment where it's a little, like in this case, it was very windy on this mountaintop and we had a lot of cloud cover. So mm -hmm. there were times where the clouds were obscuring the drone and yes, I could still see it, but it was a little risky, I guess you'd say. So more people, I wouldn't say the more the better, but I'd say the minimum of at least two other people so that one person can keep an eye on the drone and if you have that those vr goggles then one person can wear the vr goggles if you don't have the vr goggles then one other person would be enough makes sense well incidentally now that you mentioned the the wind i, I had another question with regards you know from the pilot in perspective you as the pilot flying in the face of the cliff did you experience any change in the air turbulence, you know, the effects that the waterfall might have had on your flight pattern. What did you experience while flying through that vertical? Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, the day that we flew off of that waterfall, the air was very calm, relatively speaking. Uh, when I did get closer to the waterfall, there was definitely a bit of a downdraft, but mm -hmm. it was still very manageable because it was pretty constant. And that day we were just very fortunate to have agreeable winds but when we were on this little mountainside called Lapoose the winds were quite variable so there were times where I just had to pull the drone away from what I was trying to look at and just keep it steady for a moment and let the winds die down and then just wow. zoom in as I could just be on your toes know how to fly your drone don't be afraid to pull back and say hey this isn't the best time mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answer. Yeah, you're welcome. So does anyone else have any questions that they want to ask? And Kayla, if you want to bring up the, like some of the imagery from the botanical garden that's used for um, kind of the outreach piece of it. Yeah. Um, I want to thank I you. I should share one video actually. Okay. So this video, one of my crew members, <laughs> I guess you'd say my teammates, this is a video from the waterfall day where you're sitting on that side of the waterfall and staring at your screen, but also making sure you take a look at where the drone is. And you can see to my left there, the guy is wearing those VR goggles and kind of directing me where to go. So everyone had their eyes on the drone and, you know, looking at it now, oh my God, I was sitting way too close to the edge. But back then I was like, okay, this is okay. <laughs> I will say when I first saw this site, as soon as I emerged from the path to see where I was going to fly the drone, because this was the first time I was at this 
site. I got very nervous and I was literally shaking for a couple minutes there, but then I was like, no, I have a job to do and this is going to be awesome. So once I finally got the drone in the air, it was fine. But yes, I was definitely nervous at first. Um, I'm going to show you a quick example of a video that was taken very recently when the garden was closed. This is Cassidy, my fellow drone pilot at the garden. Um, he was just taking some images of the magnolias at the garden because no one could see them because we're closed. I will say a lot of times Cassidy incorporates bits of drone imagery, photos and videos into his larger videos. So normally he doesn't have a video that's only drone imagery, but in this case, this is one that's only drone imagery here. And those are shared on the um, YouTube page of Missouri yes. Botanical Garden? Yes, these are on the Missouri Botanical Garden YouTube page. Um, you can also see all of the recent virtual live tours that are recorded and saved for us to enjoy. Excellent. Um, it may in this recording be a little bit choppy and I know it's a lot. It's probably going to be, yeah. Um, the video, but um, I will post the, the Missouri Botanical Garden YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here's the YouTube channel right here. Or, well, this is the link to the actual video, but here's our YouTube channel if you want it in the video here. Yeah. Excellent. I'm going to stop recording um, once I find that on my screen. Um, I can't find it on my screen. There we go.